You are now listening to Out of the Blank. 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 Well, welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Elizabeth Barry. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing all right, Elizabeth. Why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself and if you want what you do professionally? Sure. So I am a PhD candidate working on neuroscience research at New York Medical College. So I'm located in New York during all of this coronavirus madness. <laughs> Please don't <laughs> bring that up. It's the only reason I can't go buy toilet paper. Look. I have an intestinal issue and everybody is buying toilet paper and I have nothing to wipe my ass with. You can only take a shower so many times. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. It's so crazy. So I, like, um, what do you think about that? Do you think like, all right, cause this goes with neuroscience. Yeah. What do you, what do you think about this with everybody just panic buying everything? Like it's going to be some crazy outlet. It seems like every time we have something happen, everybody goes batshit insane thinking that the world's going to end. Is that just a fear aspect of where people think, you know, like predicting the future thinking? I think the, like, you know, there's so many movies now and there's different TV shows, but all this like apocalyptic stuff. And I feel like people are taking those like way too much to heart and like following them saying, I have to stockpile for X amount of months. Otherwise like the world's going to end, you know? So I feel like that's really, integrated into people's heads way too much <laughs> well how did you get uh, started in neuroscience did, did you always have a fascination with the human mind like for me i went to school for counseling with addiction and all this type of stuff i really wanted to help better people and try and really oh really well better people is a bad way of saying that more like trying to help people that want to overcome a problem or an addiction aspect into their life because i mean we're all addicted to something but I found psychology to be super interesting because I was always fascinated with the human mind, especially some that even deals with, um, if you want to talk about like mental, uh, ch mentally challenged people, that was always fascinating to me. Right. Yeah. I wasn't actually always interested in neuroscience. I was, I did my undergraduate degree focusing on like microbiology, immunology, like viruses, bacteria kind of stuff. Super interested in that. And then I kind of switched to neuroscience. My um, grandma she got parkinson's disease and that really kind of like triggered me to want to know more about the brain and figure out like how the hell that kind of disease happens or in general that's really kind of what started everything but i think the human mind and like the counseling is super important that's really cool where did you go to school for that i went to school well you don't don't discredit me here but it's a community college i ended up getting no, my great. only my associate's degree i wanted to go for a bachelor's i wanted to actually even go farther and make it a master's of psychology but uh i ended up taking a hiatus so i'm only 22 and i did it i did my two or three years that it takes to get your associates in a matter of like a year i just took a bunch of classes at once because i wanted to get it out of the way um I was just super fascinated with it because I would take these psychology courses and I realized there was this thing inside of me um, that I really, I, I really loved helping people and seeing like the conclusions. Like we talk about people's forms of relaxation and people's forms of therapy. My biggest one is the gym. I've yeah. stuck to it religiously, but everything that people get addicted to or things that we choose is because of the matters, I guess, our environmental factors that play at hand. There's way too much shit that our brain's trying to process all at once that is not helping any of us out at all. We're looking at information that's in the future, such as future worrying. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but you know, looking at a problem later down the road, even though it's probably never going to come up, but we sit there right. and constantly and think about it. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I, I, I've never, like, um, I took a couple of psychology classes during my undergraduate degree. But I kind of um, delved into like the more of like the molecular side and like how, like, you know, basic biology, like how our neurons in our brain are actually functioning together to create like the emotional center in their brain, like the amygdala and how that like connects to like the front top of our brain, the cortex and like how that actually creates our emotions, creates our thoughts and like results in all the different diseases and pathologies that people need to go to counselors for, you know? So like, I like looking at the molecular side of everything. I find that really interesting. 
Well, I got a lot of questions on the molecular side because I, I barely know anything about it, but I know um very few, little information I really know about it. I've talked to a molecular neuroscience in the past, but what really got me interested was the psychological aspect behind it too, that your brain can react to certain things like your body can, depending on the way you've kind of religiously thought about something such as like my cousin, for instance, he could only take a shit after a cigarette. Yeah, that was insane. Like he religiously literally one puff from a cigarette immediately in the bathroom. Any other time he could go for weeks with not having a cigarette will not go to the bathroom. But as soon as he smoked that bit of cigarette, his body reacted in a certain way that produced this. And it's a thing that our brains tend to do. What happens is when we build up like an OCD or a type of um, disorder when it comes to like a you know, it starts to get weird when things start to become rituals. Maybe it's a right. routine, but you can turn it into a ritual and sooner or later your body reacts a different way. Like for me, I haven't eaten red meat in forever. So if I eat red meat now, like a bit of a burger, I I'm won't crap for, for a very long time. Okay. My body yeah. just completely shuts down because the brain doesn't know how to process that information anymore. No, it's like, what is that? <laughs> I feel like a lot of like, speaking of that, I feel like so, like, so many people are tied to their phones now, right? Like so many people go to the bathroom with their phone. I feel like if people don't bring their phone, they won't be able to go to the bathroom now. Like kind of like the same thing, you know? I believe that 100%. I sat yeah. in the bathroom. When I go to the bathroom, I go to the bathroom. I'm in there for a very long time. Most of the time it is on my phone, but I watched Avengers Endgame on my phone. <laughs> Like, I don't, you don't need to be in the bathroom that long, but I like my time in there. It's a sense of peace. I think that was, you know, back in the day, it was the newspaper. Now it's just our cell phone. But see, the problem is the newspaper ends. Yeah. The internet does it not ends. end. Yeah. <laughs> you could scroll through Instagram forever if you want. <laughs> That's literally what people do mindlessly just scrolling through social media. Where do you think social media plays a factor into our brains. I've just noticed how it's completely isolated a lot of our emotional responses in our brain with the aspect of we're not very connected with people anymore. Yeah, so I feel like social media has really just, I don't know, like if you were like, let's say you were gonna compare a brain scan of someone who uses social media a ton compared to someone who like doesn't, who's like out in the middle of nowhere that still, you know, does, reading and like things that aren't online. I feel like centers of their brain that are in control of like their emotions and, you know, awareness of like what's around them would be super active in people who use social media, right? And like, but there's so much anxiety like with it as well. So I feel like those centers of the brain get like totally rewired in like people now and age compared to people like way back when that didn't use it so much. Well, which is it, like it also forms things of anxiety too and depression you're seeing at younger and younger ages is because they're getting i guess information way earlier and than they're i feel like they feel like they're judged too like you know i can't even imagine being in middle school right now right have you thought about that, that that's <laughs> that's what the world is the world is constantly our whole entire lives has been judging but at this point there's no end to it you know what happened back in the day when you got bullied? You got bullied at school. You'd be afraid to go to school. Now right. it takes you home. It meets you at the door. Not that your family's bullying you, but there's social media. You're getting bullied online. It's never fucking going away. You're waking up at one o'clock in the morning, and next thing you know, someone posted something about you, and you're sitting there crying, afraid to even show your face anymore because technology has kind of ruined us. And it's not really technology's fault. It's more of people's fault only because – Every time we get something or we do something and it starts out inherently good, we end up turning it sour. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I totally. And I think that's why there's so many, so much more use of prescription drugs to treat like depression and anxiety, like you said, like SSRIs and stuff like that, because of like the social media use and like the extension of all the bullying. Well, usually when people start to study neuroscience or get involved into counseling or maybe some type of therapy or psychological, at least psychology in general, what are you exactly do you have that is a bit you would call a mental disorder? Hmm. I'll admit I have I have severe depression. So, I mean, it, I might not look like it. I might not sound like it. It's very actually hard to deal with. But, you know, we're good at hiding it is what I say. But usually when I talk to someone who's fascinated with the human mind or maybe the chemical stimulus behind it, they usually suffer from something. Right. I mean, so I guess I would say I have a little bit of a twinge of OCD, right? Okay. But which it's like not like overpowering on me, though. So like I can use it. It's not like it paralyzes me like it does with some people. 
How does your so like I can I can you? use it to you like write a paper like I can just like sit down. It's like a little bit of dose of Adderall, so it's like kind of a good thing for me. I think <laughs> more like a perfectionist aspect. Yeah, like a perfectionist aspect, I guess. Like I'll, I'll be like really really hard on myself, and like I would need it to be a certain way, even if no one else has told me it has to be a certain way. But I will like you know perfect it until that point, like whatever goal that I set for myself. The way I look at disorders or mental health issues are they can be a benefit when it comes to the factor of getting stuff done, such as OCD. But the thing with disorders where it turns into a bad thing where disorders is a proper name for it is because it takes control. It exactly. corrupts us completely. My ADHD is amazing. I love it to death only because I can get so much shit done. The bad part about having such bad ADHD at the level I do, I'm also an insomniac, but I use it in the best of terms. The way I do it is I get a lot of shit done. I'm up 20 hours. I'm getting a lot of work done. I'm working you can multitask like crazy, right? Exactly. Always being productive, making something for myself. Is that okay sometimes? No, I would like to be able to sleep, but at the same time, you can't let it control you. People that are perfectionists, people that have OCD, in the right regards, there's good points about being that. I've met a lot of people that, you know, have to go over and over and over and over and over on the same task over and over again until it's 100% perfect. And they get stuff done and they get treated for it. I've seen major benefit to that, but it does become an issue when it starts kind of restricting you to certain guidelines to live by. Exactly. So it's like you have to figure out your level of like where you are in like whatever state you are with like ADHD or anxiety or like, you know, everyone has a little piece of everything, but like what is controlling you the most and like how can you best handle it? Right? Like I feel like um I guess like when I started my PhD, do you feel like you're kind of like all over the place, you don't know what you're doing because you have like classes and you're expected to be in the lab all the time, you're like, "Whoa." Like, what, what do you want me to do exactly? Because I'm doing everything right now. So it's like you have to figure out, like, where you are in your most stressful point and be like, how can I, like, best handle myself to accomplish, like, what I need to do? Or, like, even, like, step back if you realize, like, you shouldn't be pushing yourself that hard. It's all about, like, self-awareness. Well, it's even like the problem that we see today um, with uh, food reviewers. I've talked about this a few times. You know how food hashtags are getting so freaking popular on Instagram right now? Yeah. <laughs> like it's a whole trend of people just taking pictures of their food. And I called this way back in the beginning when it first started taking off. It's a serious addiction problem. I'm looking at it from the view of a person that understands what it's like that maybe have a food addiction such as like um, the type of responses that you probably know of that the brain gives off when consuming food, like the dopamine sensors, all those types right. of, basically it's a dopamine dump when you enjoy good food. People are constantly, every single day, experiencing so much trauma. And I don't mean like, oh my God, somebody died. I mean like, no, like you go to work, you know, you get yelled at, you have an argument, all these types of things that are needed. Don't get me wrong. I'll come back to that. But they're called micro fractures. Like if you look, take a nice sheet of glass. Every day you have those little minor fractures or whatever. It's a crack in the glass. Then when you get home, what do you do? You go to sleep. You don't deal with those things. Right. I think um, it's a, it's, hang on, Elizabeth, real quick. But with the food review and I was saying is the fact is when you get those dopamine responses to food, you get all these types of things, it's an addiction process. Now, like we talk about the minor stress fractures um, cracked into the glass. When you go home, you go to sleep. You usually after a long day, right? You don't feel like dealing with the world. You don't feel like yeah, going out. Exactly. Well, when you go to sleep, you know what happens? Those problems don't get solved. They end up getting buried and getting held up into your mind that can affect your sleep. But mostly, you know, when you say, just sleep on it. Okay. Well, then you wake up the next day. You might forget it's about it. <laughs> it's exactly, Elizabeth. It is still there. So this is where food reviewing has become really popular because people are finding that response, that addiction to food. They're getting this weird trend where it's bringing them comfortability instead of talking to someone. I could go to a therapist and I could talk to a therapist and explain to them the world of problems. And I have a therapist and I've went to her and I've talked to her and I'm just sitting there I already know what's fucking wrong with me. She goes, what? I'm like, I observe way too much. I've basically, you know, when someone gives you a compliment of like, hey, you've aged beyond your, you know, your years, like you sound yeah. older than you are. That's a bad thing, but it's also a benefit. The benefit is you understand and you have more knowledge, but the bad thing is you've been exposed to way too much information. 
Right, too young. Yeah. I think um, with like the brain, it's so fascinating because like my mind from the beginning of when I first started this podcast to where I'm at now, it is completely just taken a whole 180. I feel like I know a lot more, but I'm also exposed to a lot more. I have a lot more different thoughts. I have a lot more different understanding of the world. And I choose to watch now rather than talk a whole lot, at least in my everyday life. I've learned a little bit more about people that I'm not too happy about. And I've learned that there is this inherent thing inside of all of us to initially care about each other, but the world is clouded by judgment. Yeah, completely. I'm sure you've, um, <laughs> have you heard of the, the like phrase imposter syndrome? Yes. Yeah. So that's like something that basically every PhD program, every student, like you go in, right. You go into any, anyone who goes into a class, right. Or starts a program, starts a major, you're like, okay, I'm going to like learn all about this. I'm going to read this chapter. I'm going to ace this class. And then, okay, you go, you ace the class. And at the end of the class, you're like, wow, there's so much more. <laughs> like, okay, I finished my class, but like, there's so much more that I don't know now. And basically I feel like that's what's happening with the social media and like the access to like internet all the time in general, because you're online, you could look up as much stuff as you possibly could, but you're never going to look up anything, like everything, right? If you're never going to like be able to look up every single topic, every single aspect, like you're not going to read every single news article. So I feel like that's like driving a lot of society's anxiety too, right? Because we have so much access to everything, but we have like an inability to mentally like hold it all in and look at all of it, right? Yeah, well, the problem even with imposter syndrome, if you want to talk about that, is the factor of with the internet, everyone feels like they can get the answer for everything. They can do everything on their own. They think they're the smartest person in the world as long as they have this device in their pocket. Like, oh, oh let me Google that. Let me Google that. Let me Google that. Let me Google that. Yeah. Oh, you think, <laughs> oh, you think it's this? Well, I think it's this. Actually, I have this. You know, WebMD tells me I have this. Fuck WebMD. WebMD is a liar. It told me after I ate two boxes of Raisin Bran and did not go to the bathroom for a while and was in <laughs> severe pain that I had stomach cancer. So that's a lie you want to toss right out the window. But it's, 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 a, it's a huge thing now because with me, with podcasting, any average kid, maybe 20 years old, 19 years old, every adult's going to look at you and be like, you just think you know the world. And most of the time they act like they do know everything. Me? Yeah just knowing a little bit of information and starting to get more knowledge. I understand knowledge is power and I know nothing compared to anybody in the world. I legit and probably, I consider myself one of the dumbest people because I think there's always information out there that needs to be processed and always information that we need to be learned, but I think it needs to be done correctly. And the way correctly is doing it at a, a, at a rate, at a pace, you know, it's, you can get overloaded with information, much like you going through school. What that does is it can shut your whole brain down. You notice probably doing um, your medical classes and stuff when you're learning about a bunch of different syndromes, you probably started thinking you had some of these conditions at one point. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone goes through that or like, oh my God, I had this pain in my side. I probably have like liver cancer or something like that, you know? Well, even with um, just the whole matter, I think it all boils down to stress. I think a lot of the stuff that our brain starts to shut down chemically, such as certain responses in our brain, such as certain nerve endings, happens to do with an amount of information that's being processed. It's very, very stressful. Exactly. Yeah. And like a good example of that, like tying, you know, neuro in with like some drugs, like, so, you know, like SSRIs, right? They're like serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And like serotonin is the neurotransmitter in the brain that gets released to basically like regulate mood state. It's also you really know, good. It's also really good for sleep. It is very good for sleep as well. <laughs> my lab actually, so like my project directly doesn't study these neurons, but there's neurons in the dorsal raphe, which is a part in the back of the brain. They are the only, like that region of the brain contains all of the neurons that produce serotonin. So they are very important and they are highly involved in sleep because my lab is like basically primarily a sleep lab, but I'm like kind of like, the side trail looking at addiction aspects of everything. <laughs> so which, but, um, which, which uh, field of study in the neuroscience are you most fascinated with? The disease part of it or more on the, uh, like you said, you're in a sleep lab. So do you like the sleep study or do you prefer, prefer your, doing your own route when it comes to addiction? So I'm not necessarily ingrained in like a certain aspect, like let's say addiction or sleep or neurodegenerative diseases. I'm more interested in like how the brain is connected, 
and like how the different areas of the brain respond to different like drug states. So let's say like someone who like takes heroin, right? Someone who takes like cocaine, something that like any of the addicted addictive drugs, right? They take that, and then there are different like changes that occur in your brain, and those changes like may or may not be permanent. Some of them are some of those are permanent. But I, I like studying how different neurons physiologically respond in those different states because I feel like that will help us understand better the other diseases. Like using drugs is a good method to understand different diseases because we can understand like how plastic, how much our neurons can change and how much our brain can change to like result in different behaviors, different, you know, emotions, different um, abilities to learn, kind of stuff like that. That's what I'm more interested in. <laughs> what have you learned the most doing your research or what have you found the most fascinating? So one of the techniques that I use is called electrophysiology. And I that technique, which is basically you I, I have the ability to record electrical properties from single neurons, live neurons. So as that neuron is producing an electrical signal, I can see how it's reacting, let's say, to a drug if I put morphine onto the neuron or an animal who has been you know trained for a certain experiment and I can see how that learning experience or that drug experience changed that single population of neurons and that that has really like changed my view on everything because if you can you know you can't like physiologically understand a human brain right you can't have a human subject like we can't that. even we can't even fathom us being alive that's the whole no. thing like that's why religion is a thing is because that we had to make something in our head or i'm not saying it's not real what i'm saying is we had to conjure up something to believe in something to think that there is a higher power because understanding how we got here is impossible for us to even comprehend exactly yeah which is why like so like the speaking of like the whole like how did we get here kind of thing i i feel like i've kind of come full circle with everything because like i said i started with microbiology and immunology right and in those classes i took this one that was like advanced um environmental microbiology and what did we learn in that we learned about like the generation of like the initial life right it was like down in deep sea and there were these like pockets that formed under the sea and like electrical gradients formed and all of a sudden we were able to get like single cells and like that's basically how everything started right and now i'm like transitioned to doing like the brain studying the brain and like how how did we get from a single like bacteria right and then now we have this like massive cells in our brain that is able to control and like have all these different thoughts and basically i don't know it's like super hard concept right <laughs> uh, you definitely i think it's really lost, cool you definitely lost me there <laughs> sorry well i mean even with understanding the brain in general like do you not like have you ever gotten interested in something that you've come across in your research or just in studies in general of learning that you thought was inspiringly interesting like for me i always looked at the fact of you ever heard of foreign accent syndrome no. So it's like if you bump your head, the next thing you know, you speak in an accent that you've never talked like before. There was a woman in England that had a straight British accent. I mean, legit, like, hello, how are you doing? Like that, that whole thing. Now she speaks with an Asian accent because she had an accident where she bumped the right side of her head. And next thing you know, she woke up and completely talked in a whole different thing. What? <laughs> yes, and that's happened on multiple occasions. There is a literally an Asian woman that, you know, had the accent, had the barely spoke English. Now she speaks with a southern accent because she had an extreme condition where a brain aneurysm or something. And then when they did surgery, she woke up and next thing you know, this thing happened. That's crazy. I've never heard of that. <laughs> it's called foreign accent syndrome. It's 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 nuts. When I found that out, I was like you're sitting there looking and watching the video like is this real is this real and then i started diving really heavily into like tourette syndrome what receptors in the brain are not being fired off or which ones are being fired off that are not supposed to be firing off yeah wow like even with schizo schizophrenia is one of my favorite things to even study because if you look at like do you know what the cure for schizophrenia was for a very long time what electroconvulsive therapy oh well yeah <laughs> they use that for lots of things right yeah they use that to shock the neurons 
that start to fire up whenever someone's experiencing a sign of schizophrenia. They can look at a certain part of the brain and be able to say like, oh, this happens. This is what's causing his delusions. Let's make sure that as soon as that happens, we can shock him into submission so his brain will immediately stay away from those types of things. Well, right. we're looking at better ways with it now with like um, EMDR, that form of therapy, which is actually really interesting using like types of clicks and different types of tapping methods to be able to like when one of those things up, it's basically like um, if you take a stress ball and squeeze it a few times. Right. Like it's so something you can overcome it and kind of push it away. Yeah. Like that stuff is really, really fascinating to me because I look at somebody and I'm like, besides looking at the psychological standpoint of how a person thinks, acts, and talks based on like environmental influences, genetics, all these other types of things that I'm interested about, there's something deeper on the chemical scale. Like when your brain doesn't give a certain type of hormone or something into there, it can throw your whole body out of whack. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. I mean, if you look at like, um, people always think of an illness or an injury or disability or something as like being something that's a physical as like an arm loss or leg loss or something like that. I'm like, have we not really focused on invisible illness, the stuff that affects people on an everyday basis that the fact is that it just can't be seen? Yeah. And I mean, like, I guess the problem is like, we just really don't know how everything is like, we know, like, okay, we have less of one hormone or something like that. But what is the global impact of that in the body? Like, we have no idea, which is like the scary point, right? Yeah. There's like so much that we don't know. So it's like we can give a drug for this specific target, but we only know maybe how it works in one region of the brain or one region of the body. And it's like so hard to like transition to like the whole, you know, personalized medicine, right? Yeah. I feel like that is going to really help everything else. Cause like, Let's say there are two people with like schizophrenia, right? They're, they may both have like the clinical diagnosis of schizophrenia, but it's probably caused by different brain region or like a different, you know, a different start to their life, which was like caused that and like their brains change differently. So I feel like if we can, you know, dissect things like that, we could better overcome and maybe better understand everything instead of lumping everything into these broad categories, right? Well, we, we found a template that works, right, with medicine. That's the whole reason yeah. why it's so popular for so long is the fact is people want an instant fix. Like, I, oh, I have a headache. I want to go away now. It's like, okay, here's this medicine. Oh, your back hurts. Here's this medicine. But now we're finding types of – when you meant personalized medicine, you meant like yoga, meditation, all these other types of things that people are looking for. I was uh, more talking about like – so let's bring it to like more cancer level. Like, you know, someone has a specific type of cancer, like BRCA or something like that for breast cancer. Have you heard of that one? I have, have heard of BRCA, yeah. Yeah. So, like, there's, like, specific genes that cause certain cancers, right? So, we can give people specific drugs to target those specific genes. Instead okay, of like, I got you. Instead of, like, everyone, like, blanketing, like, okay, here is a cancer drug. Here's, like, mass chemo drug. Let's kill all your cells. No, let's just kill the ones that are bad. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's perfect. Like more like talking about um, uh, personalized medicine being like one that is literally straight up for you and you only. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was looking at like when you were talking about um, personalized medicine, I was thinking on the lines of like yoga and types of these forms of meditation that are good for um, anxiety disorders and stuff, you know, more of the psychological um, aspect of things, uh, especially like you're seeing with kids nowadays, you know, suffering from severe depression at a young age, but the medical aspect of it too. I mean, that is a I mean, big both are super important i mean like it could only honestly go hand in hand because like with any disease you're gonna have emotional impact and you're gonna have to deal with that let's say by doing yoga by going for a run by doing something that will help you on the outside while you can also take a medicine that would also you know knock it off from the inside at the same time well that's why doctors always prioritize your mental health when you start um, suffering from something that's physical like people that suffer from a certain type of cancer or get, you know, a, a serious illness. The first thing that it is, is how are you doing? Do you need to get into a form of therapy? Because your body is basically shutting down or maybe going through something extreme and that creates depression. And when that creates depression, you know, your mind starts to fail. And that's always when they talk about like, once your mind fails, it, that's it. You're, you're, you're not going to be able to heal because if you're not exactly. in the right state of mind, you're not positive, you're negative all the time. You're just going to keep all that bad energy inside of you to the point where you don't even give a shit if you live or not. Right. And like, I guess uh, that kind of reminds me of like, you know, when you're elderly or someone's elderly, like your grandparents or something like that, 
and maybe some of them have cancer, maybe them, some of them don't. They've just been lived a great life and they're super old now and they aren't working or like, you know, mentally or physically able to do the things that they like to do. And some people can live for like forever, like until like 110, you know, or like 120. I think there's some people that have lived that long. But some people, you know, they just like mentally, they're like, no, I'm okay. Like I'm, you know, I'm done. I'm going to stop now. And then they can like, it's like almost they can control when they can go. Have you heard that or seen that before? I've seen that in elderly people. Like if someone like my great grandfather, for instance, um, my great grandma died at like 91 or something. And my grandpa died not too long after. And I think he just gave up, you know? Like my great grandfather, like they were together for 60, 70 something years. So yeah. when, when it happened, he was just like, I'm done. Like, I'm good. Like he literally seeing him after all that was just like, I'm good, man. This is it for me. Like, I don't got anything else to do. I don't really care what happens. You know, like, it, you know, I think he ended up giving up. And if that was giving up on the mindset of maybe not eating or maybe not doing something, neglecting himself a little bit, it just seemed like his heart gave out. He died literally of a heartbreak. Right. I think our minds are really, really powerful. And I think the most important thing when it does come to physical health is more on the mental health aspect of things that I don't feel like for so long doctors and people weren't really Understood looking at the connection, right? Yeah. Like there's a lot of things like for me, for instance, I'm suffering from an intestinal issue and I just started kind of researching a lot of um, things besides modern day medicine when it comes to like IBS or all these other types of colon issues. And I right. looked at the brain to gut connection. Yeah. Big and deal. I, really yeah. big deal. And it was talking about the amount of stress. And I was like, I suffer from a lot of stress and I never, ever am able to release it. And it feels like my organs are twisted inside. And then when I had a therapy session with someone, I was just sitting there literally talking, like, I already know what's wrong with me. I got this, this, and, you know, going on and on and on. I was like, I honestly just need someone to vent to. And then afterwards, I, I felt my stomach felt untightened. I felt like I, everything was working properly again. I felt whole again, but like it builds up again from that tension. It's all a form of anxiety. Yeah. And like, I guess so, like, coming back to so like talking about IBS and like those types of diseases and the serotonin again right and like it's all linked so like you have you can have dysregulation of that in your gut too not just like in your brain which totally linked to anxiety like the people that i've experienced that have had you know ibs or crohn's disease or like anything like that they've all suffered from like extreme like maybe like social anxiety or like you know like even like they're they don't want to go order at a counter because that gives them anxiety like varying like differences in like how people handle social situations they and like they all had that tie who suffer from that so that's definitely linked well even with social anxiety that everyone's going to start getting that sooner or later i don't think it's a special person only because we have this mentality as people to fucking judge other people that's where we're at like yeah before it was like oh i don't want uh i don't want i don't want kelsey to see me in these sweatpants like i don't want her to see me like this it was like that now it's like everybody's judging you on what you wear what you have you have to go out looking like you're going to a five-star restaurant to even feel comfortable anymore yeah it's like, like oh i'm going to kmart but i gotta put on my makeup gotta like get my best clothes on <laughs> and like all the time. it was I, I don't want to say it was a gender thing. Like it was primarily women that kind of thought this way, mostly like on the basis of their looks because they've been judged by their looks throughout society's ways. That's always what it's been. It's right. been judged by looks. Now it's everybody's being judged and now men are experiencing it more. I actually talked to a few doctors and they were letting me know like, yeah, you're seeing a lot of conditions when it comes to body dysmorphia, when it comes to eating disorders that are actually primarily in women like most common in women like 90 percent of cases now is starting to shift guys are starting to experience it because now guys are starting to care about all the judgment factors that are now being pushed upon them but back yeah, in the day a guy could be overweight a gut whatever wear a tank top look like shit have beer stains all over and pizza pizza stains all over is he going to be attractive like david hasselhoff Probably not, but at the same time, you didn't get—they didn't give a shit because you, you. It was. It wasn't a main thing for a guy to be like that. Now everybody has got to have a six pack, has to have this amazing lifestyle, has to be a baller, has to have all this money, has to have amazing income, has to have a nice credit score. It's like fuck. It's like you're being judged by so many things, but primarily it's it is mainly on looks. What's on the outside? Nobody cares about what's on the inside. 
Yeah. And like, I guess like speaking of like all the things that you just said, it's like making like everyone has to be like a perfect person. Right. And like, there's this ideal of, you know, what the perfect person is now. And I don't know where that came from, like where maybe it was from magazines or Victoria's Secret or, you know, TV shows for like, like talking about like suits, you know, that show suits, <laughs> you know, I don't know, like the images have come from somewhere, but now everyone has like in their own mind, a role model that they think everyone else thinks they need to be, which is what's so toxic, I think. And even with our devices giving us like an artificial stimuli, like I have no idea where that even fit into our actual brain chemicals. Like how did we decide that this is actually going to release some type of hormone or something through a device that is literally doing nothing but just giving us something funny to look at? I mean, I guess that initial response of creating laughter, but a lot of the time it's just pain and stress. Yeah. I totally agree. Like, I I mean, I'll even find myself sometimes, you know, like the iPhones now or like phones in general, you can just tap them and they'll turn on, right? Yeah. Like the screen will turn on. Like, I'll find myself doing that sometimes, like not purposely going to look at my phone, but like my hand will just sometimes tap it. And I'm like, what is that? Like, why am I doing that? Like, why the fuck am I on my phone right now? I don't need to be on my phone right now. But you do it anyway and you sit there and scroll through random shit not knowing what you're looking at. Yeah, but like at the back of your mind, you're like, oh, I could be doing this, this, and this, but now nah, I'm just going to sit here and be on my phone, which I hate. I hate that. And it's like, but it's hard to fight. Do you well, ever feel that too? Yeah, it's a routine. Like what I do is um, I broke my phone a long time ago, maybe like last year around this time. I broke my phone. I didn't have one for three days. You know what I did every single morning when I woke up out of bed? What? I checked to see my phone and there was no phone there. I realized that was an issue. So now I keep my phone away from me basically at all times. I only have it to set up something for a podcast or, you know, um, check on it. Like if I'm watching a video or something, but most of the time I leave my phone in my car, you know, mostly cause it's too big to fit in my pants. But at the <laughs> same time, it's, I noticed that that was a problem. I didn't want to continue. I'll miss calls. I'll be at work, not touching my phone. You get addicted to these types of things because they're fun. That's, that's why addiction starts is it's fun. It's filling a void for something. Yeah, exactly. And that's, which is like, I guess, again, why I'm glad I'm actually studying addiction. <laughs> so I want to see why the hell, like things are so easily like able to change us, you know? Well, it's, it, they all play a big giant role into it. I know my fascination also came with um, understanding the brain and how people work was, um, dealing with people that were uh, mentally disabled. That was a big one for me, trying to understand why the brain was working in that way and why something couldn't function properly to the point that it would cause a disability. Right. I, or, the, I, or the people that are like um, savants in something, right? Exactly, Who like have an amazing skill. Specifically can do like engineering or like computer science extremely well, but everything else, absolutely not, right? It's like, it makes me think that all the sensors are all the, they, you know, they talk about um like two kids being born or either at the same time or a few years apart, where it seems like all the awesome, amazing traits, like athleticism, knowledge, all that goes into the one. And then the other one's just left without really anything. Yeah. I think th there's, there's something weird there. Like the hormones, all of it, like during the time of pregnancy or something went into the first kid. And then the second one, there wasn't enough left over or didn't reproduce the same amount after all those years. And it didn't, it didn't, it didn't inherit into the second one. Right. Cause like everyone's like, oh, like I'm totally different from my brother or sister. Right. Like someone's like super artsy or someone's like super into science or math. But like a lot of the times, like they're not going to be in the same track. And like, is that, like you said, because of like the hormones or how like, the baby was in, like, you know, developing in the mom during that period of time? Or is it like a nurture versus nature thing, right? That could all be on, on an aspect of what they ate as well. Like, yeah. for instance, um, a woman that's pregnant has chocolate chip ice cream, for instance, and the kid comes out loves chocolate chip ice cream, because that's what he had, you know, what I mean, that's, what he, that's what he was basically getting nutrients wise, because the mom was eating it at the full time. Then she goes to her next pregnancy, instead of having chocolate ice cream has vanilla ice cream. Next thing you know, that new kid is having vanilla ice cream and hates chocolate. It's a weird thing. I think that develops our 
everything. I think all that plays a giant factor into our lives, what we love to eat, what we enjoy, the things we hate. They're all secret little messages or codes, I believe, in the matrix line that goes up into our life or just our brain in general. I like to think of our brain like a giant networking system connected in so many different ways. Yeah, I totally agree. There's so many like little changes that, you know, like like the identical twin thing too, right? You've seen studies with that where, you know, they have the same exact DNA, but they're completely different people. And like, how does that happen? <laughs> that one's an interesting one. And also, have you ever seen, um, the, you never heard of the phantom limb syndrome? I have heard of that one. That one's wild. Okay. So they had this thing. They did a study. I forgot. Oh my God. I wish I could remember the form of therapy it was. That's going to kill me all day if I don't remember it. Watch it. We're going to be podcasting. It's going to come up later in the conversation. Um, but there's a, there's a form of therapy where they would do is they would have your hands on top of a table and they would slowly rub like either like a side of it or a top of it to make your hand feel that rubbing sensation. Then yeah. what they would do is they would tell you to shut your eyes. They would do that for another couple of minutes and then they would have you put your hands down or leave one hand up on the table. And then they would do, the, they would say that they're doing the same thing. Your brain would falsely believe it, but it right. they, weren't, they yeah. weren't actually touching it. I've like, um, there's something similar to, I think it was on like, maybe Disney, I don't know if you have Disney plus, there was like the National Geographic thing. There was something on, um, like they, 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 someone put one hand up on the table and they would put the other hand like behind this table fold so that you couldn't see it. And they put a fake hand in front of them where their like real hand really would be. And they would like, you know, rub on both of their hands, but instead of just like having them withdraw their hand, they would actually smash a hammer onto the fake hand and a lot of them would like withdraw their hand and like say ow like they would actually be hit but it wasn't actually their hand see this is when i look at things i'm like what why does it that certain emotions also release certain chemicals or hormones into our body like right. that like explaining that for instance that would strike fear Fear would yeah. create adrenaline and would create a rush of emotion and being scared, but scared each emotion that we have, anger, love, all these things, release a different chemical into our body. Yeah, activates a different region of the brain, yeah. Uh, I want to write a book on neuroscience now. I want to find out. I need someone to write it for me. Would you write it? <laughs> I'm going to, I'll write something. I'm just because the brain is so complex. Like everyone always talks about, like let's go to space, let's go do this, let's create the iPhone 20. It's like let's worry about the most what important we got here. thing. Yeah, <laughs> like this giant thing inside of our head that we barely understand, and we're worried about the planet. Like we can't take care of the planet until we know ourselves. Yeah, like why? Because like why do people need to do like the plastic bag use? Like we're getting rid of plastic bags, we're getting rid of straws, we're getting rid of like like random things like that but it's like breaking people's habits of using stuff and like how do you break a habit i don't know we don't know because we don't know how the brain works right <laughs> and it's literally like with like um the cte that football players are experiencing them age beyond their years you know just from the wear and tear on their brain why is it that when someone has a brain um surgery or something next thing you know you could slip up as the doctor slice something and the person might not be able to move their arm yeah yeah uh, our, like our bodies are so sensitive, our minds are so sensitive, but we treat our literally like it all like shit, and we don't understand the consequences of it. If you fall a certain way, I don't know how many times I fell as a kid, you know, maybe that's why I'm kind of messed up today. But when it came <laughs> to like falling backwards and hitting the back of my head on a dresser, I did that like three or four times my whole entire life. I there was. I think a case that happened where someone hit their head like the back very, very hard, and they went blind. Yeah, because your visual cortex is back there. That's fascinating as shit. Why does that happen? And why is there a way I could hit them again? And next thing you know, they can see? <laughs> I don't know. We have no idea. That's the whole problem. <laughs> ah, see, that's where, where. So what exactly is the function of the brain that's, that's good with reading? So reading is like a combination between language, right? And vision and like cognitive processing because you have to be able to understand like what the hell the sentence means right okay. which like are all in different regions of the brain so but like if you cut off any of those regions you're not going to be able to do it but i guess something similar to that in a way is like so have you heard of people who 
can no longer talk after a stroke. Yeah. But there's a solution to that. And have you heard what the solution can be? I don't know. Just like giving them a Jolly Rancher or something. <laughs> so it's actually like, um, if you can teach the person to sing, they can actually learn to talk through singing again. Because like they're controlled by different regions of the brain. Hold on a second. So if someone starts singing, don't stop believing. But do they, do they say words in the tone of the song? Exactly. Like, so don't stop believing. It's like, don't stop believing. So he would be like, I need toilet paper. Right. So like they'll be able to transition from like, okay, I love this song. They get the person to sing the song and eventually they can replace it with words that they want. And then you can just transition to actually like saying the things that you want without the tone behind it again. Wow. Holy crap. Just the lonely guy <laughs> sitting on the toilet <laughs> with your phone. <laughs> exactly. That's that's insane. Holy crap. I never even knew that. I learned about like um people that dealt with like uh, Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or trying to find better ways like memory games to keep their brain in check and be able to kind of slow the initial or the I guess the the, the declination, I would say, of their health. Right. Um, but it's so fascinating that we learned out these kind of little bit of tricks. It's like hacking your life. Literally, I have another hack. It has to do with Parkinson's disease since you brought it up. <laughs> since I'm like highly interested in that one. So like, you know how like people with Parkinson's disease they don't walk very well, right? Yeah. They have that like gait, that rigid gait where they can't really like, you know, function properly and walk like they normally could and fall a lot of the time. It turns out the people, what, if you like dance with them, they can actually walk with like a normal gait. <laughs> so everything's in a rhythm. Yeah. And you can kind of consider when you lose one of these functions that you're tossed out of rhythm. Yeah. Oh. What's weird behind that too is I actually met a woman when I worked with and she was ha hiding that she had Parkinson's. Like nobody, we've all worked with her for years and nobody knew. And then I one day saw her holding her wrist and having her other hand tucked in, trying to hold her other wrist. And I was noticed she was shaking them back and forth. And I thought like that was weird. But then I started noticing the trembles a little bit. Right. I asked her about it and she said, yeah, don't tell anybody. I've been hiding this. This is something I've been experiencing for a while now. And it's getting pretty worse and worse and worse. There's a sense of pride behind trying to not really show your weakness or show something's wrong with you. There is. They, a lot of people, like, I mean, with anything, they hide something that people could potentially see as, like, you know, they're malfunctioning as a person, right? And not being that perfect kind of person again, coming back to that. Is that all a sense of, like, failure or judgment that people are going to look at you like less of a person? Totally. Like, I mean, it's the same thing as just you don't want to go to the grocery store. You don't want to go to the mall without looking your best, right? You don't want to tell someone... Like, I have OCD. You don't want to tell someone that I have depression because they'll be like, oh, like, I can't act like I normally was around you now because I know this, like, piece of information. It's, like, all tied together like that, and it's awful because people should be accepting about these things, but they're not. Wow. Don't you think there's a way to fix that as people? Like, there's a way to reset our brains to a mentality of caring about us again? Definitely think so. What but people you... have to be open-minded. Hmm. So what would you suggest would be a good fix or at least a start to a fix? Probably focusing on yourself and saying that it's okay the way that I look. It's okay the way that I think. It's okay that I'm different than whoever I'm seeing on TV or whoever I eat lunch with in the day, every day, you know? Like you have to like be self-aware and be okay with yourself before you can even accept someone else, right? You have to accept yourself first. I do believe that in a regard, but where I do have a problem with self-care is only because of the way we've taken everything and turned it sour. When it comes to self-care, then people become very selfish and that, that becomes is true. an issue. That and is true. Like I look at it like when we're trying to help people, just treat people like you would want to be treated. The same simple shit we've been taught as kids. It's so easy to follow. The rule book was always there. We just put it down and trying to form it into our own new way. Yeah, that is true. And I guess, I don't know, when, if you're brought to like an area that isn't as well off as yours, I feel like that opens your eyes too. So maybe people are just like too stuck in on themselves and like what they do on a daily lives and don't 
open their eyes to what other people are doing too. So you're right about that. Well, even life experiences, I look at someone like yelling in a store and I look at them and I start to analyze them a little bit. Like, what are you, what are you upset about? You're definitely not upset that this woman has 18 items in the 12 item or less aisle. You're obviously upset about something else. And then you look and you see the guy that goes outside after screaming at a woman in the store, he's riding on like a spare tire or something. So he probably just experienced a car malfunction or a flat tire or something. So that's why he's upset. He's taking it out. Right. But people would just initially just focus on the yelling and be like, oh, he's an awful person, but not take the full picture into account. Exactly. I've started this thing where I will call people out on their shit. Um, I like not, that. Not to be mean, but more like if I can sense bullshit or if I can like, am I in a store or something and you're going, oh my God. Like I remember there's a woman in a store looking for her bank card. She was of elderly age and she was taking an extremely long time, I will admit. But I'm standing behind this guy and this guy just goes, <sighs> are you fucking serious? Like out loud so everyone can hear. And I just looked at him. I was like, is there a fucking problem, dude? Are you in that much of a hurry? Like just like that. Wasn't getting aggressive. He looked at me like, what? I'm like, dude, she, you can obviously tell she's trying. Why are you going to do that? Just so we can all look at you and be like, oh, he's upset. You think you're calling out something that we all don't notice is happening? Just fucking get on with your life, dude. It's not that big of an issue. And he just looked at me like, who the fuck are you talking to? I'm like, I'm talking to you, dude. Like, does it really fucking matter 10 minutes from now? Are you going to start a confrontation over this? And he goes, yeah, whatever. And just goes on with his day. I'm like, that's how simple it is. Call people out on their shit. It's, it's yeah. not difficult. We're all here trying to work together. And the only reason it's so damn complicated is because we make it so damn complicated. Right. And people's patience are like zero seconds now. They don't even tolerate anything. That's because of the phones. Yeah. Because we have instant access to everything all the time. Everything's got to be now, now, now. It's like, can you wait a fucking month? It sucks. I know you want that Amazon. Fuck you, Amazon, with your two-day delivery bullshit. <laughs> that ruined everybody. And Domino's, or is it Domino's or Pizza Hut that's 30 minutes or less? That's not a good one either. No, it's not. <laughs> you, too, you want your pizza? It's going to take uh, two days. They got to make the pizza. So hold up. If you made the pizza, it would take longer. So <laughs> Exactly. It's going to take two days. It's like, what? Two days for a pizza. Do you want it or not? I still want it, but I don't know. It's a lot. No, the Pizza Hut should be like, all right, if you are unhappy with your service, here's the ingredients. Let's see how long it takes for you to make this. <laughs> or just fucking go to another pizza place. Yeah. But we lived in this world for so long where it's competition. You got to be better than the next guy. You got to have more than the next guy. You got to have faster stuff than the next guy. It turns all back around to what we're doing as people. Yeah. And everyone, everyone is like, I don't know, slightly against each other in that sense instead of working together. Life is so it's strange. always like a rush to get better than everybody. Life is strange. I think, what do you stand on medical marijuana? Because I had a buddy come on my podcast that actually did a test study where he was giving people with Parkinson's marijuana and it was actually helping to at least slow down their, I guess, oh, deterioration. Oh, I'm totally 100% for that. And like, well, okay, like while we might not know how like the CBD and, you know, THC interact with different receptors in the brain, like what the long-term effects are, if it's going to help someone, like that, 100%, give it to them as much as they want. <laughs> I literally think everything has to be done in the right amount and we tend to overdo everything. I end up thinking that this medical marijuana stuff that's starting to become legal everywhere is going to mm -hmm. end up going in a bad route just on the factor of people tend to do that with something when it becomes really, really good. We tend to kind of twist it. I yeah. think it's safe for some people. I don't think you should be getting all like at least going off the street to get it because you think you have an anxiety disorder because there's other ways yeah, no. to deal with that. You don't know what people are doing with that either. It's, it's, it's a rocky road. I think we're just off to a weird start. And I think we got so much more to understand that it's going to take a very long time. Probably we're going to be off this earth before we even tend to look at the human mind. Yeah. We don't, <laughs> we don't know what's going on with the long-term effects of that at all. That's for sure. What and I mean, like, it, it could have been, like, really um, cool. They, like, we could have, like, taken, like, the marijuana and, like, you know, looked at it in, like, a scientific way first and be like, how is this useful in a positive way? Instead of shaming it and then slowly bringing it out, allowing people to, like, overuse it too, right? Exactly. I See, it's weird because any type of good thing we get, like, I always talked about, you know, the gene chip? Yeah. There's like this chip they want to put in the back of your head so you can have, like, Google in the back of your head. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. 
that is awesome when it comes to being able to understand foreign languages it, without having like an app or some type of second way or learning a whole new language, just being able to have Google translate in your ear or something. But I fucking know people. I know guys. And I know after an hour of that wonderful information on the back of your head, you're going to be looking up porn 10 minutes later. Yeah, it'll like people, like you said, will just overuse it or use it for the wrong reasons. And then that starts a whole route down bionic implantation or an- bionic implementation such as like my buddy that's like dude if i could get a robot arm i would love that it's like once you start it's like a tattoo once you get one you end up going batshit nuts exactly because it's all making life easier (laughs) yeah who knows it'll come to that soon i feel like right next like you know a couple decades people are weird dude i mean i I could do a bionic foot but i don't know about anything else (laughs) what what not even a bionic hand Nah, because I like the real feel of things, I guess you would say. I'm really, really like, if I was going to, most people talk about, like, if I asked you, what sense would you want to lose? Hmm. It's a tough question. It is a really tough question. Honestly. My guidance counselor dropped that question on me when I was three years, or when I was in third grade, not three years old. That'd be nuts. Probably touch, if that's not weird. That's the one everybody would choose to lose. And that's yeah, the one I it? that's the one I cherish the most. You cherish touching the most? Yeah, because I wouldn't know what the feel of like if you just put your hand on like a nice desk right now or like a nice whatever, just anything, grasp something in your hand and just sit there and actually feel it around in your fingers. Imagine yeah. that being gone. Like that was a, a form of therapy I actually learned to discover was if you have too much information being processed around you. I just told, like, you know, I told myself, like, feel this desk. This desk is real. Feel the maple, whatever the hell this is, the lines in the table, the stories you can tell, the information that your fingers are processing. Helps bring into real moments to understand that everything you're worried about is nothing. This is now. This is real. That was always really, really important to me. I was a kid. I focused. I mean, I see with my hands, basically. I'm always grabbing shit. Even at a museum, they're like, don't touch that. I'm like, I'm going to fucking touch it because this is how I get my information. And, um... <laughs> You know, everyone, you know, very few people would say maybe losing a sense of sight, maybe losing a sense of hearing, very, very rare. I would cherish touch the most, but if I had to lose one thing, I'd probably lose the sense of taste. Taste doesn't, really? that taste is nothing to me. It just, it, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, I get that, but that's also linked to your sense of smell. I would still like to be able to smell things, but the sense of taste is something I can live without, but the sense of touch, I don't want to live in a world that would, you know, you don't have a sense of touch. It feels like you'd be completely in the dark. Yeah, I guess the, you know, because like I was thinking like sense of touch, like, yes, you wouldn't be able to feel the difference between like paper and sand, like normal people are in like sand or something like that, right? Exactly. But there's like still pressure, right? Like you'd still be able to feel your hand like push on something. You wouldn't, you, know? feel, you wouldn't feel anything. People with sense of touch, they don't know if their organs are in pain. They don't know anything. It actually makes it very dangerous. Actually, you wouldn't even be able to tell if you put your hand on a stove. And that is true. That's that, it's actually become a problem. There was a uh, case of a person that um, didn't have a sense of touch, and basically she couldn't leave the house ever. You know, she was 15, 14 years old or something, and her mom was afraid because she can't sense if there's something intensely wrong with her. I mean, you know when you're out of whack. You know when you're sick. You know if there's something wrong inside of your body, but imagine not being able to sense that. Yeah, that's true. I, I didn't think – I didn't, like, realize that was all connected like that. Yeah, I like just feeling stuff, though. That's the main reason why I, want. <laughs> I don't really care. I mean, if I, I do have, like, a silly putty with me at all times. So I totally agree with that. It feels good, right? It does feel good. <laughs> and plus, you got to have your sense of smell to smell those weird ass candles like fireworks souffle. You're like, what the fuck's a fireworks souffle? <laughs> yeah, like who named it that? Does it really smell like a fireworks souffle? <laughs> but you smell it and you're like, that's exactly what it would smell like. Ugh. Or like all those candles that are on Yankee Candle that smell. They like have like, you know, like Everglade green or whatever, but then they all smell like men's cologne. Have you like, seen star, them? Star Breeze Summer Night. It's like, what the fuck does a Star Breeze Summer Night smell like and how'd you get it into a candle? Does the, does the star have a breeze? Like, <laughs> Apparently uh. it's a freaking home goods they do. <laughs> well, Elizabeth, I really appreciate you coming out and doing the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. I want to give you here a minute at the end if you want to promote your Instagram page or be able to promote anything like an organization or any of your work that you have somewhere else. 
Um, no, that's all right. <laughs> I don't need to promote myself. I just like to communicate with everybody. There you go. Look at that. Conversation is key, and I can always be down with that. Thank <music> you.